Is there any way we could have like a half circle or some something like that? Uh, yeah, like that, exactly. Like uh, two on each side or something like that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So my name is uh, David Kolste. I'm a doctor in economics and sustainability science at the Stockholm Resilia Center. And I just graduated now before the summer, so I'm, I'm very relieved <laughs> after many years of, of studying. Yeah, but, but I thought I will, I mean, I will start a bit, uh, part of it will be telling my story of like how I got into this. I mean, I know you all have, have your ways, but I have my, mine is maybe a bit different. And that, that, I guess, form how I see these issues and how I think about sustainability. So for me, I mean, I, I started studying uh, completely different things. I was very interested in politics and uh, uh, inequality was my main like, focus in my studies, I think, earlier on. And then when I was in exchange semester, I got to hear about system dynamics and system thinking. And that really transformed my way of thinking and I started to, to question things and, and see things differently. So, so I think that this, this like the idea of seeing things in systems really helps us in understanding sustainability issues. But people, the society that we that we're in, and the education system, etc., is not really formed to seeing things in systems. So I think that's something that that really has to change. But for me, it was actually a book from 1972 that, like, for real, started me to to understand how these things work, and which is pretty strange. It's almost a 50-year-old book. N next year it will be the 50th anniversary. And it was the book uh, The Limits to Growth. Have you heard about that? Tillväxtens gränser in Swedish. So it was, it was a book about this. So when I say system thinking, I, I mostly think about system dynamics modeling, because that's my field. So the, the Limits to Growth was basically the first world model translated in the, mathema in the mathematics uh, model with different equations, etc. And the question, yes? Rome. Exactly, the Club of Rome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a report to the so-called Club of Rome, yeah. W which was a collection of industry, industry leaders ma mainly that, that were interested in thinking about the long term, the long term future. So, so, in, so 1972 was the release of the Limits to Growth. 1972 was also one of the first publications on the Gaia hypothesis, the hypothesis that the Earth's system is a self-regulatory system th that over time has evolved and that the, the feedbacks between different life forms on Earth is forming the constituencies of the atmosphere and that those feedback on the, the life itself, basically. So seeing the Gaia hypothesis lent its name from the, the Greek god of Gaia, the god of Earth, because it was seen now that the Earth is actually a living system. So it's like an, like an organism. And 1972 was also one of the first excursions out of the planet, basically seeing space from the outside. We, we, we can refer to it as the blue marble. It's a picture of, you know, the small blue dot of Earth in the surrounding nothingness of their uh, of space, basically. So I think these, these three things was really starting to change the perspective of humanity and how we see ourselves and how we see the planet. So we start to see it as, as a self-regulatory system that has to st stay within critical thresholds in order to, for life to, to be kept, basically. But 1972 was also the year of a big meeting over here in the Swedish parliament. The first United Nations conference on the human environment. Basically the first, the first time that the, the UN, which, which was an organization that previously has only been focused on security issues, uh, wars and uh, peace and war, and started to move into thinking about development issues, the long-term development of, of people, that is. On in the different countries, you know, eradicating poverty, etc. But now started to also focus on environmental issues. So this was 50 years ago. So the same year as the publication of the Limits to Growth. And this was also why that the Swedish Prime Minister at that time, Olof Palme, had to address this book in his opening remarks at the conference. And he was saying afterwards about this book that we, now we know what we need to do but if I do this, I will not be re-elected. And I think that's a perspective that has really stayed into politics for 50 years. But, but for me, starting to be interested in these issues 
I was also involved in, after the 1972 conference, we had the Rio conference, 1992, where the 20, 20 Agenda 21 was formed, which, which really also had a big influence on looking at sustainability issues and environmental issues, not only on the global level, but also on the local level. So e each Swedish municipality had an Agenda 21 office. So that was, that was also a big milestone in this. And then 2001, talking about the development issues in the UN, was the year of the Millennium Development Goals. The goals for human development mostly. How many of you have heard of the Millennium Development Goals? The Millennium Development Goals. Yes, exactly. So it was a very, very, very kind of separate stream within the UN that only focused on uh, social development basically issues, healthcare, education, etc. So, but at that time, um, after that was the Rio Plus 20, 2012, now it's many years. And 2012 was then 10 years ago basically almost. So, so, so just before the, um, uh, just before what, what you said, the Sustainable Development Goals were formed. So 2012, the outcome of that UN meeting was that we want to form Sustainable Development Goals. So then there, were, there was a, an agreement within the UN that yes, this we, we, sh we should really focus on. However, that, that was for a long term a um, separate stream from development issues in the UN. So sustainable development and development were not seen as, as uh, necessarily complementary to each other. And I think this is very important to understand how we see the UN and the, the system now. Because at the UN at this time, there were, we had the developing countries that focused very much on uh, keeping the focus on development, on social progress, on education, on health outcomes, etc. And we had uh, other people focusing on environmental issues and not really seeing the, the overlap here. So there was two, two separate streams. And at one of the meetings, when I was entering the big room where, where all of the delegates were, uh, some, a representative of the G77 in China, which is the world more or less 130 or more developing countries in the world, they said that, yes, from now on, we want to stop talking about the post-2015, basically the new development goals and the sustainable development goals, but we have to see them as one. And this is very important because it also makes us understand that we are one humanity. The Millennium Development Goals was very much from the developed countries to the developing, basically very much focused on development assistance, etc. While the Sustainable Development Goals, then we see that we are actually not so far ahead. The Swedish society, for example, is, as you know, very unsustainable. So by, by integrating sustainability issues with development issues, we need to we need to start thinking about how we are dealing with things in the, in the so-called rich world as well. So, so what, what did the, this, this book say then, The Limits to Growth? What, what I got very interested in is the method that they're using. I don't know if you've heard, if anyone of you have heard about the iceberg metaphor. So yeah, you, you know it quite well maybe. So, yeah, I think so. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, there's only a very small portion that's actually above the water, so you can only see a small portion where the actual iceberg is like below the water. So yes. Yes, exactly. So, so the iceberg, exactly. So, ten percent of an iceberg, or something like this, at least a very small part of the iceberg, is actually above the water. And that that is a good metaphor for understanding things in a systems way. Because the top of the iceberg, that's what we see, right? And that's the same as the events that we see around us. So one example could be the, the flooding in Gävle, for example, this summer in Sweden. That's an event that happens, right? That's, that's what we see. But under these are trends. So trends over the longer term that we see more ex extreme weather events, for example. But to understand why there is a trend of something is increasing or decreasing, we need to understand the underlying structure, the causal, the cause effect mechanisms under this. So why do we see increasing uh, extreme weather events? Oh. What, what would you say? Why, why is this happening? 
Climate change. And, and why is climate change happening? Sorry? Rising CO2 emissions, but actually rising CO2 in the atmosphere. Oh, or greenhouse gases, more correctly, yeah, exactly, in the, in the atmosphere. The warming, that, that is creating the warming, and then one effect of that is more extreme weather events. So then we have started... Methane, methane as well. Methane as well, yes, of course, and nitrogen as well. So, so, so th these are greenhouse gases, basically, that are warming up, and w water vapor as well. So, so, then, so, so then we're starting to unpack, we moved from one event, and we're looking at the trend that this is part of, and then we're starting to see what are the causal mechanisms behind this. Why are we seeing these trends? And why, why, are, why is um, gases in the atmosphere increasing then? Yeah, and why? What's, what's behind? Industries? And why? And why? But and why are we doing that? Economy. G growth, profit, yeah, yeah. So exactly these kind of issues. So, but, but under underneath these these uh, underlying structures, we sometimes put something else, which is called mental models, our understanding of the world. But I think that's rather something parallel. So, so part of the cause and effect mechanisms are not only what we started to talk about here, the uh, the more emissions, the more gas in the atmosphere but actually also how we, we see it, our perspective of these issues. So if you take your right hand finger and uh, look up and then start making a circle like a clock, clockwise, clockwise, and then look on the finger and then slowly move it down, continue rotating, move it down below your face and look at it. Is it still clockwise? <laughs> what, what happened? Well, we changed perspective. Yeah. We changed the perspective. So, so this is how we, ha we should see and start to think about climate change as well. As you started to say now, you started to, to unwrap what is actually beneath. So w we started to say there may be more natural science focus of, of more gases in the atmosphere. And why is it more gas? So at the atmosphere can be seen as accumulation, right, of historical gases. And then we have the emissions. But then we have actually industries. And under the industries, we, we start to have like our social systems. So it's not that the, the natural system started to destroy itself. It's actually, of course, human activities. And why is that? What, what kind of economy do we have? Or what kind of societies do we have? We are destroying ourselves. Yeah, that, that's a good way of seeing it. So, um, so, so what, sh what should we do about this? I will give you some papers that I got from the... Uh, some things that are thrown from the... Oh, no, the, uh, this one, here. Yeah. <laughs> from the copying machine. So these are things that were going to be thrown away otherwise. So don't worry about the, the waste. Because <laughs> I will ask you to waste it, yeah. So that's why there's some. Do you want to be part? Yeah. It's from the copy machine at Stockholm Museum Center. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you all follow my, my directions now, yep. take this paper and then fold it in the middle. And then, yeah. And then uh, rip off one of the corners. The the top right corner, and then fold it again. Yeah, rip off, exactly. Yeah, and then, and then rip it off again. And then f fold it once more. And then you, you take the, the upper left corner, and you take off that, that part of it. And then, you, and then you fold it again, and then if you can, you should wrap up the, off the top right corner. Yeah? D did you all follow? And, and now we're going to open this and see what we got. Can I see? <laughs> so so uh, what happened here? Why are the papers different? <laughs> 
we folded it and then we didn't know how to continue. I mean, left and right is always depending on the rebels, right? all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not very clear instructions, we but have I can. You have our own, your own interpretation. Yeah, that's right. So, so actually, what was happening here is that I did not really allow you to ask me questions, right? Nope. You started to ask questions. I was just like moving on. Next, 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 next. So, what, what does this teach us? Do you think? We need to ask questions. We need to ask questions. Yes. Anything else? Left and right on the paper. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Does this tell us anything about how we should communicate climate change or how to communicate issues? So Directions? Anything else? I mean, it means that we have to accept that it, there's, we're prone to failures, like to, to mistakes. Because oh yeah. I don't think anyone can really fathom the whole science and the things behind it. Yes, yeah. And what do we do with that? So one way is to maybe complement lecturing, for example, with different forms of feedback. Because we are handling an issue that is so difficult and so complex to solve, not necessarily when it comes to science, but when it comes to societal issues, that when we communicate this, we need to listen to different perspectives. And we, need, we need also need to have feedback in how we teach things and how we, how we communicate things. So when I do something, if, if you were allowed to ask me for every step, and give feedback, then we would probably arrive in, in a more, more of the same way we, we fold this paper. Oh, we should try it again. <laughs> Horribly, if we do, we do it again, it, it sometimes works and often not, because we still have different perspectives on things. So, and maybe that's not a problem as well in some, some issues. But I think it's important to understand that, that we're in an environment where we need to start asking questions and we need to we need to, prov to provide feedback because some of us are, are called experts in some issues, but maybe we don't have the right perspectives to understand how society unfolds, for example. So this, from a systems perspective, I was saying cause and effect mechanisms. So basically cause and effect is that if I do this, this, uh, this will happen. So if we emit more emissions, there would be a higher concentration in the atmosphere. So, so what I showed you was basically what, what was lacking in our folding of the paper and ripping off the corner was a negative feedback or a, a balancing feedback, basically, where you could ask and correct, ask and correct. And that's one type of feedback, uh, balancing feedback. We also have another type of feedback, which is a reinforcing feedback. And do you know any example of a reinforcing feedback? Have you heard that word before? Soot in the Arctic. Hmm? Soot in the Arctic. Soot. What's that? Soot. Soot. Oh, yeah. That, that's one, absolutely. And you... I learned some hormone mechanisms that also are reinforcing feedback. But I can't name a special one right now. Yeah. But it's not really the leader of the question. Why? <laughs> thinking uh, with the reinforced feedback that you are um, that you're aiming for somewhere already so you are approaching it that way you're, does it make sense? yeah yeah partly but but not necessarily I mean you don't it may not be intentional right so a reinforcing feedback could be for example the um, the albedo effect if you've heard about that in the climate right so the more the warmer the climate the more ice is melting and the more ice is melting the more water surface so like exactly a vicious cycle yeah so the more water water is darker i mean and then if you know if you've had a black t-shirt on the summer day you know that darker materials actually absorb heat so the water is darker and it absorbs more of the heat and then we get more heat and what, what happens then we get more melting so that is a that is a reinforcing feedback mechanisms so that, that's the alternative, the, the opposite to a, a counteracting or balancing, correcting negative feedback loop. And what is Fridays for Future? Is that a reinforcing? Is there a reinforcing loop in that? Hopefully not. <laughs> Maybe hopefully it is. It's good. Yeah. yeah. If we, I mean, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, tell me. Rise, yeah. Like we're reinforcing uh, movement. Like the more people join us, the more people hear about it, the more people join us. Exactly. So yeah, so there is a reinforcing feedback mechanism. Kind of that is very great, right? And then you it is also a reaction to climate change. Which yes. Is like the opposite. Yes, exactly. So Friday for Future movement is, is a balancing feedback of the Earth system. <laughs> no, I'm with the <laughs> I'm, I'm with the researcher's desk. Yeah. Um, we are yeah. 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 Hi. yeah. So, so, so it's basically it, it could be seen as a balancing feedback, right? And if we strengthen that balancing feedback, we can get political change, which, in the end, could make us emit less emissions, which, over a longer time perspective, could could halt the increase of CO2 concentration, greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. So Friday for Future can be seen as a balancing feedback that the Earth system is responding through some, some individuals, basically, if we follow the Gaia hypothesis. But, but as you say, we can also see it as, as a re there's also reinforcing feedback here, that the more people, exactly, I mean, I cannot say it better than you, that the more people who are, are here, the more people hear about it, the more media coverage, the more people will, will join, etc. It builds It builds a momentum, exactly. So, so, this is, so from a systems perspective, this is really what we're looking for. We're, we're looking for feedbacks, because those are explaining everything that we see in the longer term. It's different kinds of feedback mechanisms. Either balancing or reinforcing feedbacks. And we can explain everything we see with this kind of understanding. I think that earlier uh, street lectures have been about the Great Acceleration. Many of those, yes. Yes. So you know that, that yeah. the human activities are reinforcing, or they are growing exponentially. And when, 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 as a system thinker, when you see something growing exponentially, you, you think that there must be a reinforcing feedback behind this, explaining this. So there is some kind of feedback mechanism here, when it comes to human development, and population and wealth etc that is reinforcing and then that is then affecting the climate and the earth system negatively in a way so i will end with three so what, what i found very fascinating for me was that the group that wrote this book in 1972 the limits to growth that i started with they they continue with system thinking in their lives but many of them were not continuing in science but rather went out in society in different ways. And one of them wrote a book, or a couple of books, about system thinking games. So the, the paper tier that we did here, and the, and the circles in the air, is part of that book. Because they thought that it's not enough, we have, we have had this model now for 50 years, and, and we still not, we have not changed enough yet. So we need different ways of communicating this. So we need to have feedbacks, we need to to have a movement that, that is doing this, etc., etc. So these are games to increase our understanding of, of these issues. So I will, I will do one with you now. So I will ask you to cross, cross your arms, and then look down on the arms, and remember which one is on top. And then release, if it's the left or the right. And then release. And then cross your arm again, and look down which one is on top, and then remember, and then... Voila. So now I will do a little survey here. How many of you had the same arm on top both times? Almost everyone. So then there may, may be an optimum here, right? That we have learned through evolution that, that this arm should be on top for some, some reason or the other. So how many of you had the right arm on top both times? How many had the left arm on top both times? It's around 50-50, as I say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I've done this with 50 people and 100 people and it's always around 50-50. And why is it so? Because of our habits. As humans we learn habits, right? We start to, we adapt to the society and we do things in a certain way. And when we're comfortable with it, why change? And now, now try to cross your arms in the other way around, with the other one on top. How, do, how does it feel? I don't like it. Yeah. It feels uncomfortable like just to get there. Not like holding it, I, I know just it's not but a big I issue. But I have yeah. and I know I'm doing the exact same thing, but it's uncomfortable. Yeah, I feel fine. Yeah?
How did you feel? It felt weird at first, but I got used to it. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe that's how our change that we're in now is feeling. It feels weird at first, and it's a bit uncomfortable at first, but we can get used to it. So what we're doing with in our lives and how we're forming our lives and the way we live can change. It's a bit uncomfortable at first, but then we can get used to other ways of living. And that, that's also true when it comes to think about global change issues. And to end with one more of these. You, you felt rather comfortable after a while, yeah. And that's maybe how we should see our habits as well. Habits changing to a more sustainable world, basically. So now, now to end, I would like us to, to, because there's a lot of people around here, I think we should make some noise. Yeah. So I will, th I will say one, two, three, clap, and then I want everyone to clap. So, so that they will, it will sound like a big giant just clapping, right? Yeah. So one, two, three, clap, and then we all clap. No, 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 no. So I say one, two, three, clap, and then we clap. Okay? Clap after um. you say clap. Yes, okay. yes. Okay? Yeah. Yes, okay. So just yes, do it. Okay. One, two, three, clap. That's not what you said. <laughs> exactly. One, two, three, clap. Or one, two, three, clap. Yeah, one, two, three, clap. You say I one, two, three, clap, clap, and then we clap. Uh, Wait, can you show us what you want to do? And, 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 and what does. I, I did exactly what I wanted to do. And why, why did I do it this way? To show that we were all on the wrong way. To surprise us. To make fools of us. But to make a point, surely. I just know. And what, what would be the point? I mean, that we have to communicate better. It's that, like the people. That we have to try more than one time. We didn't get the proper instructions. We, we, were, gonna, <laughs> we were gonna ask you questions. Was it clap? On the clap? Or is it not after clear the clap? So, so what, what, what different? So what, was I not clear in my communication or my action?